Let me start. I'm Brian Parks, CEO of Jam Factory. For those who don't know me, um, let me start by acknowledging that we're here on Ghana land and, and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging and uh, you know, really reflect on how important it is that we do that everywhere we can. Um, it's a real treat for me to be able to introduce uh, Dr. Trent Jansen and Dr. Guy Kuhlmans, uh, who are both great designers in their own right, but also great design researchers um, at the University of New South Wales in Sydney and the University of South Australia, respectively. Um, we are jointly uh, partnering with both of these uh, lead researchers, is that the, the lead investigators, uh, on a, a kind of uh, ARC council funded research project looking at uh, the idea of transformative repair. And I won't talk too much about it because that's what uh, Guy and Trent will be talking about. But it's a really exciting thing and Jam Factory uh, is, is, I think, um, Really, I personally am very pleased that we're part of this research project, which will see outcomes over a number of, of years. And we, um, and Guy and Trent, have been working with the Australian Design Centre in Sydney on some of the first iterations of some of the public outcomes uh, of some of that, which they'll talk about, no doubt. Um, and I reckon that's enough from me. And uh, we're, we're recording this, so um, uh, you can uh, tell people about uh, how to access it, and, and a lot of people uh, will find it interesting that are missing out today. So. Thank you very much, Guy. Thanks, Brian. Cheers. Um, yeah, great, great introduction, Brian. Thank you. Um, uh, I guess before we begin, I'd also like to acknowledge um, that I'm speaking from the lands of the Ghana people, and, uh, and Trent is speaking from the lands of the Darawal of the uh, Illawarra and Southern Sydney. But actually, um, it's worth noting that we did this project uh, across a whole bunch of different lands um, belonging to First Nations cultures all around the world. Um, and uh, that includes like, um, you know, First Nations from uh, Texas and California um, and also Western Australia. And actually at the end of the video that we're going to play later today, we'll, you'll see an acknowledgement of those peoples. Um, and yeah, as Brian said, um, this research has been funded by the Australian Research Council. Um, we're really pleased to receive this grant. Couldn't have done it without Brian's help and um, his team here at Jam Factory. And great to see so many familiar faces in the audience. Um, and also, of course, um, the Australian Design Centre. And, and the work that we're presenting today is the first phase of the research, uh, which was conducted primarily with the Australian Design Centre. Um, and um, maybe at the end of the uh, presentation today, we'll talk a little bit about um, what we're planning to do at Jam Factory too. Um, but just to begin, um, I wanted to actually show this work, uh, because actually it's not the first piece of transformative repair practice that I did uh, myself. Um, it was actually done in 2015 um, after I'd already been doing kind of repair and reuse in my own personal practice for, you know, f f eight, ten years maybe or something. But, um, but I did this one at Jam Factory. So I was here uh, in 2015 as resident artist um, and I actually photographed this in that little tiny photo room that's outside the metal studio. Um, and, you know, I was, I was quite happy with that, how that turned out, actually, using photoluminescent pigments. And, of course, you know, the references to Kintsugi, um, the traditional Japanese craft of uh, ceramic repair using gold. But I'm just trying to shift it, um, trying to do something different in terms of how we perceive that, um, maybe bring it into a new technological age. Um, and it's also true when I go back to earlier works that I did in my career, such as this one, which was called Smash Repair, which involved designing a structure that is iteratively uh, broken and repaired multiple times uh, in order to generate, uh, you know, kind of a new form. Um, and this for me, you know, I, I haven't done much precisely like this since there, but what it did was open my thinking to what repair can be and how repair can work as a transformative method. Um, and that's also true for this work, which I did uh, back in 2007 or 8, um, which is, you know, also kind of it, it visually communicates the idea that repair can be reuse um, or, and transformation as well. Um, it's, it was kind of broken, that chair, um, but in the process of thinking about fixing it, you know, I chopped it up and actually made it into two chairs. And I, I really like that open-ended approach to repair. Um, where it starts to blur boundaries into, you know, reuse, remanufacturing and, and, and more. Um, and then I'm going to pass it over to Trent to talk about his work uh, and how important they are on the uh, formative influences of this project. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope that you can hear me and perhaps see a little tiny version of me. Um, I'm, I'm coming to you from Darwell country on the south coast of New South Wales and want to acknowledge 
eldest past president emerging for this country. It's a, it's a beautiful part of the world, and I feel very, very happy to be here. Um, I'm not here. I'm not there with you today because I thought it would be fairly hypocritical to uh, to fly in to give a talk that was largely focused on sustainability. That didn't sit with me very well. So I'm I'm there with you virtually. Um, so if guys are the kind of transformative repairer in our team, I'm the transformative reuser, I suppose. We, we possibly both cross over that, that little um, line a little bit from time to time. But this was my first experiment with transformative reuse or adaptive reuse from 2004, actually. My major project as a university student, um, the science school reusing um, discarded road signs to make furniture. Um, I've done a lot of... of um, Oh, can we can we go to the next slide? I was just trying to do it myself and realized I can. Um, I've done a lot of um, experiments over the years with cultures outside of my own into the way that other cultures do these types of practices. So this is um, a piece called Jugard with car parts. Jugard is like make do, but but the Hindi word for for make do. Um, it's it's about we, we basically used. Um, discarded car panels in the Chor Bazaar in Mumbai and worked with some fabricators that usually do air conditioning ducting to, to generate new forms using those sheets of metal. Um, next slide for this guy. Uh, and most recently, I've, I've, my, my work is focused a great deal on working with First Nations Australian artists, um, particularly um, over the past few years, artists from the Kimberley region. So. Um, Nikana, Wonkajunka, Wamanjari artists from around the Kimberley region, uh, around Fitzroy Crossing. And this is a work that I designed in collaboration with Johnny Naguda and, and Rita, Minga, Rita Minga, two artists from, from that community. And it's sort of an unusual one to include in a conversation about adaptive reuse, but the adaptive reuse here is the hair. This is human hair that was collected from a local barber and, and then um, using this amazing um, traditional technique of spinning hair, um, using a spindle on the artist's leg, it's turned into these long strands of sort of rope from human hair. Um, and then the next one, please, Guy, uh, is a, a work that again came out of a collaboration with Johnny Naguda, uh, Nikana artist from, from the Kimberley region, who I've been collaborating with a lot over the last few, few years and feel incredibly privileged to work with Johnny He's an incredibly knowledgeable leather worker, has worked as a remote cattle station leather worker for many years. And um, we play around with, with found metal, and uh, you, see, you can see the substrate in there is, a, is some found aluminium from a scrapyard. Um, so that's an introduction to, to the kind of work that I had done prior to this project and what makes me relevant to it, I suppose. Cool, thanks, Trent. And yeah, it's kind of. Um, uh important for me to acknowledge that there's two particular aspects to Trent's works that I find inspiring and which have fed into the aims of this transformative repair project. Um, firstly, like the Jugard project that he did in India, you know, examines how perceptions of re repair and reuse change across cultures. I think that's really important. And then the secondly, you know, Trent has quite high level uh, representation within the collectible design market. Um, and that's important because it potentializes high level institutional and market changes in how sustainable design is perceived and appreciated. Um, so insofar as um, the aims of this research go, we wanted to test the market for transformative repair. Um, and this gave us inspiration to work with some of the very best designers that we could find, um, as well as artists and craftspeople, and also then test it in a particular format, which in this case was an auction. Um, and uh, we'll get onto that in a moment. Um, but firstly, I just wanted to uh, introduce some of the artists that we're working with. Um, trying to get a kind of a, a, a mix of um, men and women, I guess, um, but also, yeah, designers, artists, craftspeople. Um, we have jewelers like Kyoko Hashimoto, uh, my partner, uh, craftspeople like Liz Williamson in textiles, um, and Tala Carson, who worked with Liz, um, and Adam Goodrum, you know, very well known product designer. Um, and uh, Trent, do you want to introduce the, the rest? Yeah, I think um, Dave Kayon is someone that we spoke about working with very early because he's, um, I suppose, I hope this one wouldn't offend him, but quite a traditional industrial designer, does interiors and, and objects for Qantas, one of his major clients. And we were really interested to see how his approach might um, manifest in this type of 
um, in this type of practice. And then there's Lucy McRae, a um, very well-known now Australian-born artist who lives in Los Angeles, uh, who's, who um, I don't know, I've known for a number of years and we're very lucky, was interested to work on the project with us. Um, Liam Naguda, who is Johnny Naguda, who I collaborate with regularly, son um, from the Kimberley region of West Australia, is an incredible knife maker. Um, and you'll understand when we show you some of the broken objects why we thought Iliam might be a really great fit for one of those for one of those objects. Um, have, we, have we covered everybody? Have we covered uh, well, just briefly, um, there's also Ebony Satchwell, who uh, we, is actually a digital artist, which might seem a little bit strange, but we'll explain why she was brought into the project to assist uh, Kyoko. Um, and then there's also Lucy McRae, um, you know, who's kind of on the periphery of design. She calls, calls herself a body architect and has notable works in fashion, sculpture, installation and, and generally speculative design. Um, but with, that was a real catch. Um, and uh, they're all Australian, although, you know, Lucy actually has spent most of her time overseas and Ebony now works overseas. And, and that caused some logistical issues, but quite solvable. Um, the one thing I just want to say before I change to the next slide too is that all, because these designers all have their, and artists and craftspeople all have their own disciplinary skill sets and conventions um, that don't necessarily accommodate repair or reuse practice. Um, that's something we're really uh, conscious of. And in fact, we kind of try and challenge a bit. We try and maybe even provoke them a little bit with the kind of objects we provide them. And actually, if, if you weren't familiar with the work that I've done in the past, um, uh, with and without Trent, um, it, it is often simply a case of like, well, you, let's get some broken objects, let's collect them and then distribute them to creative practitioners. Uh, that's what I did with uh, object therapy from 2016, but also um, a previous iteration of transformative repair, which I did with regional uh, institutions in uh, Noosa and Launceston, Tasmania. Uh, and this is the kind of uh, works that we collected. So these are beautiful, uh, sort of mid 20th century, uh, they're called planar spider pairs, chairs, sorry, planar spider chairs, uh, made by French company Hoffa, um, and uh, have had, you know, literally 50, 60 years of, of life. Um, these were provided by the Sydney gallerist Sally Dan Cuthbert. Um, that's a, just a picture of me sweaty carrying them like around. Um, yeah, we, we worked with Hugo Grusman, who is one half of the band Flight Facilities, um, someone I'd wanted to work with for a long time in some capacity. Um, and he named his band you know, after his interest in aerospace. Um, and he had model aeroplanes to provide to the project. Um, the second one is particularly noticeable because it's a model aeroplane that he replicates the um, aeroplane of his grandfather whose company was called Flight Facilities and was the direct influence of the name of his band. Um, we had this scooter uh, that was gifted to us by the actress Yale uh, Stone, who's perhaps best well known for her role in uh, Orange is the New Black. Um, and that had a really beautiful you know, story to it that related to her time growing up and the sense of freedom as a young woman riding around Sydney. Um, yeah, I mean, Trent, do you want to talk about this one? Yeah, sure. So I, I guess I, sh I should begin also by framing how we how we um, contacted these people. We were sort of interested in working with uh, creative practitioners who, who might have an interest in the creative elements of the project, but also a bunch of these individuals who donated the work are climate change activists. You know, so the the sustainability aspects of the project we spoke to them. Um, this is a lamp by the Campana Brothers, um, the very famous Brazilian design duo, but donated to the project by the Tuscan um, manufacturer Edra. And uh, they were very um, generous to give us this thing that, that had been marked during, during transport uh, in some way that we're not totally clear on, you know, pulled out of the pack, package too vigorously or something. Um, had, had minimal damage, but to the point where they couldn't sell it on, so, so they were happy to give it to, give it to the project. Um, the next image is an axe that was donated by um, scientist, explorer, and conservationist Tim Flannery. Um, he, he lives in a suburb not far from me and, and um, has been involved in a climate change activist, activist group that I'm part of locally and, and asked him if he might have anything broken that, that, he, that he could give to the project and this is what he gave us, which was like so interesting as a symbol of, of um, 
you know, forestation that uh, we thought it was such a beautiful um, object to include. Uh, and then the next slide, the next couple of slides are images of clothing donated by Bianca Spender, um, fashion designer from Sydney, long-term friend, and, and someone who's very interested in the sustain sustainability of, of her fashion practice. Um, they have these, these pieces of clothing that, that have small defects that go into a room in her in her headquarters and um, just kind of stockpiling them because they're not terribly sure what to do with them. Uh, so she was very happy to give us basically as many, you know, um, imperfect pieces of clothing as we could as we could take. And we we selected a bunch based on Lucy's Lucy McRae's um, preferences for thick uh, textiles, and we boxed them all up and shipped them to LA so that she could transform them. So. Um the, the, the task then was, yeah, as Trent just described, was to distribute them to the artists, designers and craftspeople that we'd gathered. Um, and that wasn't always easy, but it, there was a kind of a sort of intuitive um, um, approach to it, um, a lot of discussion and so on. And it's kind of, that's, that's what, as, part of the, as far as the methods go, that's one of the hardest things to actually describe, but um, we figured it out. Um, we actually were documenting as much of this as possible. Uh, our research methods also include interviews. So we were interviewing both the object um, donors uh, and the transformative repairers at the moment that they you know, received the goods or soon after and, and, and later too. Um, so we prepared a, 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 some documentary film. Um, this isn't quite complete because it doesn't include the end result, which was the auction, and we'll talk about that after. But we actually thought just for the middle of this presentation, we'll play this video, which is about 10 or 15 minutes long. So fundamentally, I think transformative repair and reuse is about the transformation of objects and materials, but in particular, the transformation of objects and materials that would otherwise become waste. But I think beyond that, uh, it's also about the transformation of culture and, and in some respects, the transformation, transformation of community. It has this kind of thing that if we can sort of start to value waste or materials that would otherwise become waste and we can start to see what its potential is and how it can um, become more beautiful and more functional and, and have another uh, life and another purpose beyond its previous life then that can transform the way we see the world. I keep com coming back to this kind of consistent truth that there's in many ways no better way of being sustainable than to just use something that's already had a life. One, uh, one evening when I was putting the children um, in the chair that one of them actually fell through. So um, <laughs> they, they were actually in okay condition, not great, um, until we started probably using more and more. And there was probably a period of, of 15 years from them not being sat in. So, you know, there was probably a little bit of deterioration over that time, being brought back from Paris, being in my great aunt's house, then being in storage and being in mine and being starting to be used again with the humidity and the conditions. But even at the beginning, when I first started m making some contacts for about the repair, people was, no, 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 we don't, no experience and we don't, we wouldn't touch it. Like, and I think because of mm. what, the chairs are, a lot of people just didn't want to touch them either and be responsible mm. for them. Mm. I asked a lot of people about the sticker if they would just remove it for me because the powder coater would completely burn them off and no one wanted to touch them either. So how was that resolved? I just researched for hours how to um, keep a, a sticker it's intact. It's a secret. It's a secret. We have transformed the chairs, but they're still a chair, they're still a functional chair, like the planner spider chairs were originally. I've been, well, I started weaving in the late 70s. And so I have gone through many forms of learning about weaving, but I've essentially been weaving since then because, you know, and that's a long time. I just wanted to get a little bit of background um, about these objects from you um, before you know I start the repair process. I think that would really help with my process. Well, um, the uh, the Qantas one initially that was actually belonged to my brother James, and he um, mm -hmm. I think Dad got it for him. It was sort of one of those things that we all we both sort of funnily enough had an obsession with planes and cars and boats. I suppose like most boys do. We've had it for must have had it for thirty years. 
now, I think. And it's just sort of dried out and cracked a bit and you can see that it's kind of fallen apart, but I still love how it looks. And I, I love mm -hmm. the old 747 shape and there's something that's so classic about it. So it's obviously um, a, a mass manufactured object um, made of plastic. Um, I love the shape as well. And I wanted to do something that hopefully maintains the shape. I can either build it back up or break it down. You know what I mean? So I can cut it further into smaller pieces and build from that. I thought about even grinding it all the way down to like just powder and then just working with just the sort of plastic particles. I mean, sometimes it's nice to have boundaries because you know then which, which realm stay in, but then it's also you get some of the crazy stuff when you just go out there. But um, I, think, I think I love the shape of them because they're the most classic and reliable aeroplane and, and there's something really cool about that. So maybe, maybe this is your chance to make the evolution of the 747. That was a replica of uh, my grandfather Laurie's plane. And it was his Cessna yeah. 310. And he um, he used to have that hanging in his office. And his office was in Marimbula upstairs in the airport. And it um, uh, used to just hang from hang from the roof there. It was all just, I think, about playing homage to the plane, its legacy, and the place it came from. And just capturing kind of like a nice, like gentle, quiet, stillness that I think about when I think about that place. Well, just like I say, obsolescence is in the eyes of the beholder. You know, people take obsolescent objects in South Africa. I've seen people make the most wonderful are string bags out of old used plastic bags that are, you know, then they have a, a new life, you know. And you see the same thing around the world, people taking things and, and reimagining them. So, um, and I think, it's, I think it's great. It's just, we're, we're held back by our conventional understanding about what things are quite often. Oh yeah, so, well, back then, when I started making artworks, artifacts, I always lived by this little, little code that I always got. If I can't buy it, you know, might as well make it, you know. And if I can't get the materials I need, you know, like, well, materials, you know, cost money, you know, like plank of wood and iron cost money. So I started, and yeah, now nah, there's heaps of metal in the bush and all that. So I started, yeah, collecting from the bush, all the tough metal and yeah, all of that. Mm. Yeah, look, everything wears out, even us. Um, so, you know, breaking down is part of that process of wearing out, I guess. And the world is in constant retransformation as the fossils that I studied when I was younger. Uh, told me, you know, what is now land was once sea. What was once a living shell is now a piece of rock. Well, I was thinking um, I was going to repair it, you know, repair it, make it brand new. But then I was thinking, uh, I was going to, I was thinking about carving on it, doing a carving. But then, nah, that's a bit too, uh, because carving that was done like worldwide, you know, people carving on X. So um, I was looking at it, I, I left that action on the table and it's have a strong look at it, you know. I was thinking, saying, what to do? Then him, then him came to me, or oh, this wooden house, wooden cabin, and then clicked straight away, or oh, then built houses with this, you know, with this axe. So then chopped the tree down, split split the wood into planks. And I'm thinking, oh yeah, that's what I'll do. So I'll build a house on top of it, you know, to show that that axe been, built that house or something, you know. So that's what I'm doing, yeah. So it came to me, yeah. Look, I think it's, um, it's amazing. He's, um, he's turned the axe into both the object that the axe is made to serve, the house, and the object the axe came from, the trees. Uh, it kind of tells a little story there, really. It's, it's a really nice piece of art, I think. And we should point out that Ilium Naguda, the artist who made it, has made a miniature of your axe for you. Oh really? That's what's in that small box in the front there? Oh my god! I would love to. Thank you. <laughs> oh my goodness! Oh, that's fantastic! Wow, it really is a little. It's proper. It's got a proper steel head on it. That is fantastic. I mean, we had no expectation of this at all. It just showed up in the box. So the story of the scooter. I should just start there. The story of the scooter is that my mum bought this scooter in secret. And my dad has always ridden motorbikes and mum not. And 
mum just got on this, got a bee in her bonnet, and she secretly went and did, she organized, she, she bought the scooter and then she said to my dad, like, let's go on a date and I'll meet you. You ride your scooter and I'll meet you in Circular Quay and at this specific location. And then he turned up and there she was on this cute little Vespa. It's very cute, isn't it? The whole story is very romantic. Um, and she was like, yeah, I ride a scooter now. So it has a beautiful beginning. In my personal life, yeah, I have sort of often, you know, tried to repair or fix something. I get a, I think there's a certain sense of satisfaction, a certain sense of machismo even maybe like, daddy fixed it, you know, <laughs> my kids love. It's gotten to the point that my son thinks I can fix anything. Well, the scooter did actually mechanically start to start to become a challenge and um, the balance of freedom and mechanical oppression became a little heavier on the mechanical oppression and I couldn't make it work. You know, as a whole, it's, it's still a really functional object. So all, all, all that we had to really do in the end was focus on um, rebirthing it. So I, I really did want this, I really do want this thing back on the road and, and being loved again by somebody. Ready? Yeah. And I, th I, th I think like stages of life for humans, for animals and objects are really fascinating. Like no one could have predicted this. I was a bit nervous at the beginning, you know, a bit of a responsibility, the Campana brothers and doing something with their work. So I didn't, yeah, it took me a little while to work out what to do until I decided that I wanted to do something different to what existed, but I wanted to use every piece, you know, all the components that was part of the original piece. Yeah, I, I, I remember the Campana, the Campana brothers when uh, we start to speaking about this, this uh, um, lamp. The, the lamp is uh, the lamp was a little bit an, uh, an uh, secondary. Uh, arguments. The, the, the first arguments was uh, was the, the, to, to to have this kind of um, of greed of, of, of use of uh, transformation. Yeah? Since the beginning, we have a, uh, this question about uh, sustainability. Uh, we didn't want to work with noble woods from the Amazon. So we start finding uh, things, uh, giving a second skin to ma materials already existed. In some ways it was unexpectedly easier than I thought. I thought that um, it might get challenging to put all these things together so it actually worked out. But because the nature of them is so juxtaposed and everywhere, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's in the hands of the gods, the way they all come together. So it's kind of lovely, and that is the nature of the way the original piece is. <laughs> I love it. And this, love is, it. this is the fall. Oh, beautiful. Amazing. Beautiful, very beautiful. It's a, it's a new lamp. Um, there is a responsibility because I really appreciate the Campana brothers' work. But at the same time, I think it's good not to be overly precious too, you know. It's just um, it's having a bit of fun with an object and creating something that's hopefully interesting and should resonate on some form, you know, being different to what it originally was. Uh, it's amazing, amazing. And it's a, it's, it's a good way to, 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 it's a good project. For 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 I I I I'm very curious to see other other object. And I always think about every single silkworm or cotton bud that was picked off a tree that goes into the incredible story of making a piece of clothing outside of creative work, outside of all of the amazing hands. There's just so many layers that bring objects together. And then there's another layer that is, you know, what we call permanently damaged. And that is the garments that we contributed to this project. Well, the, the Bianca Spender clothing was 
wonderful but it hurt to cut it up because it felt like I, I was you know I shouldn't be doing that um, but we did it anyway um, and then the the other fabrics that I chose are um, actually external materials for outside which kind of in keeps with it being a sun lounger. I think there is a broader question around imperfection in our society and how we can accept it and what we can accept. I think that we have got to a place in our industrialization where we are looking for perfection in everything. And I think that we need to challenge that as creatives and designers. And then from 3D, we, we, un, we color it, unwrap it, make all the patterns, cut all the foam, and then upholster it, and then do all the details. And so it's through the communication of those steps sometimes where imperfections happen and also the behavior of materials is not the behavior of a 3D model or a vector. I can see her color scheme now, which is why I flipped the back because I yeah, could tell know. that that was definitely the inside, not the outside of it. And she has so carefully with all of the binding, you know, like mirrored everything. I mean, she's gone to such intense detail. Labels are really interesting things and I, I don't know if I ever imagined seeing my label on an object like this. I would love to see someone who wasn't me trying to find the elements of the work um, in it. And I think it's very kind that she feels like um, I am a collaborator in this project. Each work that I make is an archive of a future that is a discussion around where humanity is going and this is a manifestation of that question. That kind of imperfectly uh, shows off what was done with the objects, but what we can show now is um, some still images so you can get a better sense of appreciation of, uh, of, of how they transformed. Um, I think we're going to probably get through this fairly quickly because I'm just a little bit conscious of time. Um, first of all, this is how we presented them in the catalogue. Oh, by the way, I've got a whole bunch of catalogues down here, so if you feel like grabbing one uh, afterwards, you can. Um, I guess the thing to note there is that we divided them, up, uh, divided them up into lots that were for auction. And the really tricky part there was developing estimates, uh, which we did in collaboration with the auctioneer, Andrew Shapiro, and consultations with all the creatives. Um, but it was tricky. Um, Trent, just speak up if you want to talk about anything in particular. This is the transformation of the planner spider chairs. One thing I just really want to point out here is that the uh, weaving, or actually more correctly, interlacing of the interior was incredibly complex and difficult. Um, it was something that Liz had been sitting on for months trying to figure out. She brought in Tala Carson, who uh, also a really skilled designer, couldn't figure out. And then they actually just, um, contacted an interlacing specialist and had a workshop with her to understand how that, that was designed. Um, really kind of interesting story. And um, sorry, uh, Liz also took off the old webbing, the discarded wedding that was replaced from the frames and made these four beautiful uh, uh, individual weavings. Uh, Kiyo Hashimoto's work was the Qantas plane, the, the first work that she did of, of three actually. Um, and this was cut up, cut up into small pieces and turned into a crown, AKA the Queen of the Skies, which was the moniker of the original Boeing 747 uh, used by Qantas. 
very fine work. And the, and the structure of the crown, I should mention, also follows um, the, uh, in many ways, the traditional crown typology that would be used by a conventional jeweler uh, in the way that it has claws that grip the pieces of the plane like a jewel. Um, now this last piece uh, is actually a digital artwork that was sold as an NFT, non-fungible token. Um, and this is actually a reimagining of the other plane that was broken. So um, Keo uh, scanned it, sent the 3D scan to Ebony, who then used that to create a digital artwork. Um, yeah, and so um, Ilium Naguda took the uh, axe and as it actually was explained quite well in the video there, transformed it into this um, picturesque scene, kind of like a tableau vivant of a woodcutter's cabin. Really amazing detail, I think. Really quite, quite unexpected for us to receive that when we took it out of the box, we were very surprised. Um, yeah, and this is David Kayon's, um, you know, scooter. In, in many respects, a kind of more conventional transformation. Uh, you might sort of say it sort of falls into like the custom modding uh, genre of, of automotive repair. Um, but just meticulous attention to detail. Uh, all these re really fantastic um, decorative pieces put into it. Lots of thought. Um, and, and big props to David for actually getting it running because the mechanical uh, problems were quite profound. Uh, and uh, yeah, lots of, lots of um, uh, blood and sweat put into the, getting this back on the road, including shipping parts from Italy. Uh, yeah, and so Adam Goodrum's really kind of, I would say, deft um, transformation of the Campana Brothers lamp into a floor standing lamp. Quite a kind of um, almost a minimal transformation, but quite poetic too, I think. It uses the same amount of aluminium. Uh, and here's Trent lying in Lucy McRae's Sun Lounger. Um, yeah, this was also something we, we, we really weren't quite sure what Lucy was going to do. Um, but then she started sort of, um, if I can say this politely, kind of hassling us to, to buy her a Sun Lounger. And we were like, well, we, you've already got uh, all these amazing um, clothes from Bianca Spender. What do you need a Sun Lounger for? But she had her idea. Um, and that was to produce a kind of a, a, an object which really much fits into her, um, her catalogue or her archive of existing work, which is works that are, relate to concepts of survival, compression, um, comfort, hugging. Um, and this kind of fits into all of those. Um, but it is also a transformative repair of, of these damaged clothes from Bianca Spender. And you can see here the labels that um, Lucy, was ta Lucy and Bianca were talking about uh, where she hybridized the labels together to acknowledge joint authorship. And actually this is, I haven't talked about authorship yet, but the, the shared authorship of an object that is created by one designer and then repaired transformatively by another, something I find um, really interesting. Lots of great detail in that work. Yeah, and here are all the works together. Um, and if you're interested, here is how they were exhibited um, at the Australian Design Centre in July. Um, it was a short exhibition of, I think, about 10 days, um, which ended with an auction. The exhibition was quite fun too, because we had you know, people demonstrating how the, how the, how the lounge worked. Um, there was registration for the auction, so people would collect a number that they could bid with. Uh, and this is when the auction began. Uh, Andrew ran the auction as, as, a, as a licensed auctioneer. Trent and I, you know, kind of provided commentary. Uh, this is the point of the night where I was insanely nervous uh, and probably not having much fun. Um, but when I look at the crowd shots, I kind of realized later that, well, maybe everyone except for Lisa was enjoying it. Lisa looks a little bit nervous too. Lisa Cahill, uh, director of Australian Design Center. Um, you can see Brian up the back there on the right. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it was, it was actually nice when I put this presentation together with Trent uh, over the last few days, because I was like, oh, actually, yeah, people are like, they were enjoying it. Uh, I don't know, I was, just, I was just very kind of, you know, a lot of anxiety, because it was like an unusual thing to do an auction and stuff. Um, and if you're interested, this is how, how it worked. I wouldn't say it was like a, a major success. We sold nearly half the works. Um, and we didn't sell the big ticket item, which was Lucy McRae's uh, Sun Lounger, but we did sell um, Adam Goodrum's lamp. Um, 
some weavings, the crown, and the NFT sold too, which was a nice surprise. I think that's the last slide. Um, just acknowledging um, all the partners that we uh, had from the beginning, but also that we brought into the project as it developed. Um, and yeah, um, open to questions. If Trent, unless you've got some final comments. I mean, we could perhaps talk a bit about before we close on the next phase, right? Which we're gonna do at Jam Factory. Um, so um, follow the same model in the sense that it is a collection of broken objects that we'll distribute to craftspeople, designers, and artists. Um, we wanna work with the Jam Factory community um, of practitioners. Um, so that's you guys, I think for, for the most part, um, and uh, your colleagues in the industry. Um, we're also interested in working with um, the benefactors and patrons of Jam Factory, um, their clientele, um, in terms of where we find these objects. Um, one of the things that was kind of tricky to negotiate in this project is that most of the works were gifted to us for transformation so we could repair them and then auction them. But that's not necessarily the model that we're going to follow at Jam Factory. Um, we have a feeling, uh, based on what we wrote about in the grant methods, that it will be more of a client um, and service provider arrangement. So the ownership of the objects m will likely stay with the owners, um, but the repairer will be paid a, paid a service fee. And this again, you know, is about um, the point of the research, which is to test the market for this kind of work. Uh, so I might have left you out of the, the last bit of that presentation, but did you have any comments? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what you've said and what you haven't said because I was on <laughs> your, your voice with the whole last section, and I didn't want to interrupt. But um, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did it great justice. Okay. Well, uh, sorry, Trent. Yeah, that was my fault because I muted myself when the video was playing and then forgot to unmute because I could hear myself on the amplification. Yeah, don't worry. I think I handled everything okay, um, and I explained a bit about what we're planning to do next with Jam Factory. Um, but I mean, with that, I think it might be nice to hear some questions if anyone has any. Yeah, Kath? What's happened to the objects that haven't sold? Oh, good question. So we've got them in storage and um, we're thinking about re-exhibiting them. I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to say where um, yet, but um, there's potential for selling them later. We, we it was, you know, there was a lot of challenges with doing an auction when you're not actually in the business of being an, an auctioneer. And Andrew was really helpful. But um, I think, to be honest, the reason we didn't sell all of them is we didn't quite get the right mix of people there on the night. Um, although we had some hope that it was going to happen. Um, but, you know, COVID made it tricky. It was especially cold night as well. So it's just one of those things, right? But, um, but we do think that there is a possibility to um, continue to sell them. And, and whether that's an auction or not doesn't really matter because it still tests the market. Yeah. Um, when you're looking for people to donate uh, broken objects for the next um, iteration of the project, are you looking for people who um, have a particular focus on sustainability or environmental um, concern or people who just collect beautiful objects? Like, is there a criteria for the people who donate those objects? Yeah, I mean, all of that can be considered. I mean, I think it's really nice when either the object or the owner has a, has a story. There's something in there that's, that's, that kind of deserves to be told. Um, you know, this, this relates a little bit theoretically to how I see objects as four-dimensional objects. They're not just three-dimensional objects in space, you know, they're, they're four-dimensional objects that move through time. And, and there's this visual metaphor of the space-time worm. And, and actually what's really interesting about transformative repair is it dramatically changes the shape of that worm, but it also can fork it and split it. You know, one object can become several. Um, so any kind of backstory that comes with uh, an object is, is helpful. And I think it's helpful also for the repairer because it gives them more content to, to engage with. Great question. I, I've got a response, um, but I, I did want to just want to sh perhaps share um, the question with Trent if you had a, any immediate thoughts on that, Trent. Couldn't hear the question, sorry. Oh, uh, maybe I'll just repeat it for you quickly if, if I hopefully I'll paraphrase it correctly. Um, the question pointed out that many in the audience here would agree with the sensibility of the project already. Um, the kind of people that actually care about sustainability and also repair things. But what is our strategy for 
bringing this idea into the broader world and in particular to institutions that uh, maybe even have a vested interest in not adopting sustainable practices like this? I'd, I'd be super keen to hear your answer to that one, Doug. Okay. <laughs> well, I wanted to talk about it in regards to David Kayon. Um, David Kayon, as Trent mentioned, is you know a classic industrial designer. You know he he's, he he trained here at UniSA industrial design program, uh, worked with some of the best in the world, including Mark Newson uh, over in Europe, um, and now does really high level industrial design for companies like Qantas. Right? There's no reason Qantas would necessarily want to bring in this kind of uh, concept right into their practice. Right? But by working with someone like David, it actually does potentialize that. And it might be done in a different way. I mean, you know, very possibly, you know, Qantas needs to get in on the circular economy and start figuring out how to make airlines out of more recycled aluminium and other kinds of materials or transforming their planes into other things. And maybe that's already happening in some limited capacity. But by introducing this and getting, and furthermore, I think it's not just talking to someone like David Kayon, it's actually getting him to do it and to be immersed in the project, it, it should change his own approach to design. Um, and also I think that's something that when he's creating objects uh, himself, you know, it can be something that he'll reflect on. Um, so I think, I think, you know, actually if you're interested, like the, the theoretical framing for the grant application and probably how we'll write about this was transition design. Um, which is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, tra it's basically looking at how do we transition to you know, low energy, low carbon futures, right? Um, and the interesting thing about transition design is it's an applied theory. Like it's, it's obviously got concepts that are kind of exist outside practice, but it's always looking to practice and going, you have to engage with practitioners, you have to engage with institutions and get the, the wheels turning in order for bigger things to happen. Um, I think it's in, in, in the Australian lexicon, we have through scarcity often been engaged in these sorts of so there's a kind of narrative history to build on and, and um you know things like the tire swan um as a sort of, you know, symbol of suburbia um, is such a great object of transformative repair from disused car tire um and, and so in some ways i think there's a kind of a narrative thread um specific to australia that, that might be an interesting thing to explore i don't know if you've you've looked at, at that uh, your uh, farm, make do, can do kind of stuff um, is, is, is part of that. Is that something that you've thought through? Um, it's been in the background, I think, of our conversations. I mean, I know because, you know, Trent's worked with uh, that kind of, um, like, what they you know, called Jugard in India, which is kind of like a make do. And in a previous project, we had a designer that worked with uh, a real, uh, what they call a, a Giambara, which is the Portuguese or Brazilian kind of form of make do. And, and yeah, we know there's this Australian uh, undercurrent of make do. Um, oh, I had something else I wanted to say about that though. The collective, it's a kind of high value in the collective. Yeah, yeah, no, because what I wanted to respond to is that um, you, you mentioned scarcity. The thing about scarcity is that it's unevenly distributed. Like, we're really lucky in this auditorium. We don't have much scarcity, right? But, but the world does. And so I think there's a responsibility of people who exist in cultures of abundance to actually start to move the wheels of material sustainability, uh, material conservation, right? Like this is a conservative approach, right? In the literal sense of the word. Um, and, and, and whether that actually is helpful for um, cultures of scarcity, I don't know, but, but I think it's, there's an obligation for us to actually start to be ethical, you know, right-minded in how we engage with materials. Yeah. Um, a couple of days ago, I was watching TV, and um, there's a new stone that's being produced for kitchen bathroom bench tops, and it's being made out of um, plastics, clothing, uh, things that have been dumped uh, at dumps uh, to to actually help the environment and to give those uh, items a use. And I, I think that's, it's called green stone. Yeah, yeah. And I think that is fantastic. Yeah, I, I actually, I'm not so sure. Um, there, there's, I know I, I'm aware of colleagues, former colleagues that work on these kind of green, green ceramics, right? For example, like made out of uh, crushed up 
glass, right, and then um, hybridized with polymers, waste polymers that probably don't come from landfill, but will probably come from industrial waste. Um, like, it's good in the sense that, yeah, we should do something with it, but the, the, at a technical level, a lot of that stuff actually is mixing the characteristics of different materials uh, in ways that can't be undone. I mean, glass, uh, you have a glass bottle, you can wash it. I mean, it's infinitely reusable, right? And we used to have glass washing facilities all around the world, right? Until, you know, the uh, paradigm of disposable plastic, right? And now we've got this situation where, like, there's no government support of washing bottles and using them, reusing them, right? So the New South Wales government says, well, let's crush them up and put them into roads. But like, that's complete, you know how guys hell, you guys know how much energy it takes to blow glass, right? Like, that's the energy bill. I know Brian's mentioned it to me, right? Like, the embodied energy in a, in a glass bottle, like, <laughs> fucking crush it up. Like, that's such a waste. Um, so I'm really skeptical about some of that stuff. Like, they, it, 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 they should, we should recycle as well as reuse and repair, but it needs to be um, discriminate, you know, it needs to, and, and carefully done. Yeah, yeah cool. Any, any final thoughts, Trent? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm great. I think you, you covered that as well. Thanks. Cool. Yeah, look, well, um, look, thank you, everyone. I really enjoyed talking, actually. That was really nice. Um, so thanks for coming.